So one of the things, so I was in Grand Rapids for the week for the family time and the funeral, and we took an afternoon and went to what is a pretty big deal in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's called Art Prize. And uh, Jared confessed to me that in his years of Calvin, he had never been once. I understood that when I was a college student. I almost never left campus. But um, Art Prize is a, is a rather big deal in Grand Rapids. There's a, there are some pretty significant monetary prizes for winning an art competition, and they basically fill all the downtown spaces with um, submissions from various different artists um, just trying out their art. And the big winner this year was this, which doesn't look like much to you here on the screen, but it's Abraham Lincoln made up of Lincoln pennies. So if you get close, every one of those is, is a Lincoln penny. You know, sometimes the pennies are dark and sometimes they're shiny. And so this artist went through and duplicated this very famous picture of Abraham Lincoln all in Lincoln pennies. And I think that artist won something like a quarter of a million dollars for this, um, for this piece of art. Now, now, art's a funny thing because, of course, if with a big art competition like this, artists are creative people. And creative people do a lot of creative things. And so this thing was a box with paper on it, and you were given an opportunity. A lot of the art things were, were pretty creative. One guy was a, was a poet, and you'd walk in, and you, you'd give him any word, and he would make, he'd write a little poem for you. And he wrote a few hundred thousand poems because the line was out the door. And the guy just, and he wrote it on pages he'd tear out of the dictionary. And, and so you see all this stuff. And this one was, they're going to send this box to, I don't remember exactly where, like Sedan or someplace like that. And it would be shelter for someone. And I kind of thought, I don't know if they really care about all these signatures that are on it or how they'll even interpret that in the Sedan. But... Here it is. Now, now, one of the funny things about art is, um, I also listened to a, a talk Richard Mao gave recently, and he was recollecting, uh, Richard Mao used to teach philosophy at Calvin College uh, with Nick Waltersdorf, who also used to teach philosophy at Calvin College. And um, Richard Mao's wife is into art, and he'd go to her, he'd go with her to art shows sometimes, and he'd see things like that box, and he'd just be like, what's this about? And once he saw a guy who had a big piece of plywood and he covered it with Elmer's glue and he would take old cellos and he would smash the old cellos onto the glued plywood and sell those for $1,500. And then Richard Mao looked at that and thought, is this art? Um, and, and, and Nick Waltersdorf, who was doing a lot of work in aesthetics at the time, said, well, you have to kind of understand that um, basically, that's the question, that people are trying out different things. And, and, then they, and then he smashes the cello onto the plywood, and he puts it on the wall, and he says, is this art? And, and we all, as a people, look at it and say, well, some will say yes, and some will say no. And just over time, we, we kind of get a sense of it. And, and Mao was making the point, he said, you know, this basically is called deconstructionism. And, and he said, right now, in our culture, we are doing this with all kinds of things. In fact, we're, we're deconstructing a lot of things as a culture, and we've been doing it over a long time. And Mao made the point that if you'd say deconstruction in a conservative church setting, people would get upset. But he was making the point that actually churches have been doing this too. People have been asking questions. Would you call this art? Would you call this a family? Would you call this a marriage? Would you call this a worship space? Would you call this a hymn? Would you call this a church? Would you call this Christianity? And, and, and you kind of, cultures do this when, when they come often into new spaces and new unexplored territories and they don't know quite what to do. And so people tend to have two reflexes that they use and, and use it pretty consistently and often at the same time one is to reach for something new and the other is to reach for something old and you find this all the time because on one hand if there's something new in the grocery store they say look it's new but at the same time everybody wants to eat well I want to eat a paleo diet it's like I want to eat what the cavemen ate 
And so then I'm tempted to ask, because I'm a cynic like this sometimes, well, do you want to live like the caveman lived? Um, no, I don't want to live in a cave. I want my air conditioning and my sofa and my bed and my electricity. Well, then why do you want to eat what the caveman ate? Well, and this just illustrates the kind of weird place we're in as a culture. We don't always quite know what to do. Um, uh, I don't know if I put this in. See if you can click on that, Raj. I, this is one of my favorite YouTubes. Go ahead, click on it, Raj. It's, it's, it's short. sea. Well, the sea is an image of chaos. And, and so you have this meta story, a 
about, about good creation, fall, redemption, restoration. But within the Bible, there's all these little cycles as well. And we've been in the book of 1 Kings, and, and, and in the book of 1 Kings, there are these cycles too, because the book begins with Solomon, and this is kind of Israel at its pinnacle, and then what we're watching through the whole book of Kings is Israel sliding down. And, and the authors invite us to ask questions, what is corruption like? It, and, and it invites us to ask things about our own lives. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this progress? Is this corruption? And in fact, as we go through there, we're invited to compare. And we've been on Ahab for a number of weeks. And in many ways, if you read the stories of David and Samuel, and you read the stories of Ahab and Kings, you'll notice a lot of similarities. And we'll see them especially this morning. And so, in fact, the Bible is asking us to compare David and Ahab, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, Israel at its peak, Israel as it's sliding towards decay. But the slide is kind of like that video, and you're not quite sure, is it progress? Or is it laws? Two royal cities and two temples, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem and the house of Baal in Samaria. The house of Omri, now Omri was Ahab's father, and we didn't spend any time on Omri, but Omri, like there was a military coup where Zimri kind of took over, and then things weren't going well with Zimri, so there's a civil war in the northern kingdom, and Omri, who was also a military leader in the, in the nation, he prevailed and he became king. And if you read history books, you can find Omri because he's mentioned by the Syrians and the Assyrians. Omri, in many ways, made the northern kingdom great again. It was prosperous, it was powerful, things were going well. But if you read about Omri in the Bible, you read nothing but bad things about him. And, and that then sets up Ahab, who also had a very long reign, who was a very successful king. And, and many of the Israelites who would read the book of Kings would know that and, and invite us to say, well, was Ahab progress or was Ahab corruption? Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. A Jezreelite is someone who lives in the city of Jezreel, and that's where Naboth lives, and that's where one of Ahab's palace was. Ahab had Samaria, but he also had a palace in Jezreel, and they often did that. She had a winter palace, she had a summer palace, because he didn't have air conditioning. So the vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, we'll pay you whatever it's worth. Now, this is, it seems to us, a reasonable transaction. Ahab isn't seizing the land. He's basically saying, you know, I built this palace here, and your vineyard is right there, and it would be really convenient for my servants to grow our vegetables to feed the palace here. Sell me your vineyard, I'll give you a good price. But unfortunately for Ahab, Naboth is a religious conservative. Because Naboth says, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestor. Now we can read Naboth in a couple of different ways. We can say, this land, I'm emotionally tied to it because it's the land of my father's. Or we could read Naboth and say, I am in fact a worshiper of Yahweh, and I've not been pleased with your administration and your promotion of Baal, and I know what your wife has done, and the law of the Lord explicitly states that inheritance should stay in the land, and in fact, if you read the Old Testament, you'll know something about the year of Jubilee, that in fact, if, if Naboth sold it, and if Israel were keeping the law, then when the year of Jubilee came, Naboth would get his land back. And it's quite apparent, in fact, archaeologists have looked at Israel in this time. Israel was flourishing economically, but they also began to notice that farms were beginning to grow. Now, you might listen to that and say, well, what's bad things about farms growing? Well, archaeologists look back and say, before we can tell that families had farms, and, and that these families were maintaining farms generationally. What was probably happening was that, in fact, 
wealthier people were getting wealthier and gobbling up the farms of families in an agrarian culture that probably meant that fewer and fewer people were owning more and more, which meant that more and more people had less and less and you began to have generational poverty. So in fact, in this little story, there's a lot going on. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. And we've seen this with Ahab before. Ahab is a potent, powerful, successful king, but in terms of his character, Ahab is something of a child. Um, he lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. Now, if we pause here and remember David, we might remember a story of how David is bored in the palace one day when the armies are all out fighting and he's looking out the window and what does he see or who does he see? Bathsheba. And that then leads into another story. And so think of the story of David and Bathsheba as I read the story of Ahab and Naboth. Now, we're not talking about a woman in this case. We're talking about a field, but the parables, the parallels will reveal themselves. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, now remember Jezebel is the princess of, of a pagan king. And so Jezebel grew up in a pagan palace, and Jezebel... Yes, Tommy? Well, I just thought it was interesting, like, both times that Ahab mentions, like, uh, what Naboth said, he takes the Lord out of it. That's know? exactly right. That's right. He Because Je, because Naboth then said, the Lord has given this to me, but Ahab cuts him out. That's right. It's a good observation. So... So Jezebel comes in, and she's learned how royal courts are supposed to go. So she thinks it's crazy that Ahab is here sulking on his bed. Jezebel, his wife, said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of, of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting, and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Well, I guess I skipped that part. Well, and anyway, what she, does, what she does essentially is she proclaims a day of fasting, sets up Naboth, and then says, Naboth has cursed the Lord and cursed the king, and so deserves to die. And she finds a couple of false witnesses who will testify to this, and they testify in the town that Naboth has cursed the king and cursed the Lord and deserves to die, and the false witnesses stand up and proclaim it, and they take Naboth out, and they stone him, and they take his land. Now, right away, you know that the conceit is false because if Naboth were stoned, who would the land go to? His sons. But who gets the land? Ahab. So what happens? Elijah shows up. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite. And again, you remember, David sleeps with Bathsheba. She gets pregnant. David feels in a pinch, executes a cover-up. Uriah won't take the bait, so David eventually gets Uriah killed in the cover-up, and Nathan comes to David. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, This is what the Lord says. In the place where the dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Huh. The Lord, in a sense, said, Ahab, the main job you have here is to ensure justice. What happens if you who are to ensure justice yourself 
undermines it. And as you'll notice from a number of the stories, the Lord basically says to him, you want to see justice? What you did to Naboth, I will do to you. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put off sackcloth and ashes. And again, if you remember the story of David and Bathsheba, when Nathan confronts him, David also repents. He laid in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but will bring it on the house in the days of his son. Now again, this is interesting, and, and, and I think the writers ask you the question, how do you feel about this? On one hand, you say, hey, Ahab deserves what Naboth got. I'm not sure I like the Lord's lenience to Naboth, or to Ahab. And, and, but here we are. But again, we saw almost the same thing in David. And, and so the writer asks us to compare and ask us the question, how do you feel about this? What do you think about this? What do you think it means to be king? What do you think it means to show mercy? What do you think it means to be God? Ahab, in this first story, corrupts justice. Second story. So I'm taking the text from last week and the text of this week and putting them together, so you're getting two sermons in one. <laughs> so Ahab continues, and Ahab knows that, if you remember from a few weeks ago, Ahab spared the life of this king that the Lord said he should have taken. Well, this king has now risen up, and this king has taken again swaths of Israel, and Ahab wants to go retake one of the cities of Israel. And so Ahab has been smart, and he's on better terms with the southern kingdom than his predecessors. And so he says to King Jehoshaphat from the southern kingdom, why don't you come with me and take this city? So he asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight against Reign of Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And again, if you remember from that previous sermon, these, these talks are all about status. And basically what Jehoshaphat says is, I'm with you side by side here. I'm not your servant, I'm not your master, I'm your peer. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. Now this is where your English Bibles are a little bit tricky because you always have to look for those large caps on Lord if you want to understand that they're translating the name of the Lord, meaning Yahweh. Because in the Bible, there's a word for God, which is a generic word, but then there's the name of the Lord, which is a particular word. For example, in the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, meaning Yahweh. And so Jehoshaphat basically says, okay, Naboth, or okay, Ahab, I'm down for this, but have you asked the Lord? So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, shall I go to war against, against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord, Adonai, not Yahweh, will, go, uh, will give it into the king's hands. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord, Yahweh, here whom we can inquire of? So right beneath the surface, Jehoshaphat, yeah, Ahab's an ally, yeah, Ahab's a kinsman, yeah, Ahab put up a temple to Baal, are all gods the same? Is this kind of mushy religiosity? And Jehoshaphat says, well, you know, I'll go and be your friend, but if you're asking me to stake my life on the line, I want something a little deeper. The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always prophesies bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. And then Jehoshaphat answers, the king should not say such a thing. What's going on here? Well, well, Ahab has, in fact, not only corrupted justice, but Ahab has also corrupted religion. 
Because what Ahab has done is gathered a whole bunch of prophets around himself who always tell him what he wants to hear. And Jehoshaphat, who is now being asked to put his neck on the line, says, I don't like your yes men. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but they do go to war. Well, first they ask Micaiah, and he says, oh yeah, it'll be great. And, they, and then Ahab slaps him because he doesn't believe him. And Micaiah says, yeah, I'll tell you the truth. It's going to be a disaster. And Ahab goes anyway, and Jehoshaphat goes with him, but Ahab decides he's going to be slick, and so he dresses like a common soldier, so Jehoshaphat looks like the only king on the field, and then the other kingdom, they want to kill the king, and they go and they see it's Jehoshaphat, not Ahab, but then a random arrow comes and kills Ahab, and he dies. What's the message of the story? See, Ahab corrupts justice by making it self-serving. Ahab corrupts religion by finding the religious people who always tell him exactly what he wants to hear. And so we're deconstructing the basics as we slide down corruption's trail. Is this what kingship looks like? Is this what religion looks like? Uh, now, we might wonder how to read these stories. They, uh, oftentimes, you can read them kind of like morality tales. And, and they, they work fairly well like morality tales. Um, you shouldn't kill and take your neighbor's property, as if this was a point we need to keep remaking, as if we don't keep doing it, even though we always understand, already understand how this works. Are these lessons on politics and religion? I think in the larger frame of the story, the questions are like, what does corruption look like? And it looks like a bunch of tiny little steps of self-license. That's what we see in Ahab. Now, I, I mentioned Jordan Peterson in a few sermons. He's this, he's this um, teacher of, of psychology at the University of Toronto, and he's, he's been gathering quite a following, often of, of atheists who are interested in the Bible now in a new way because this guy's been mining it. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting listening to it because for, for many of these atheists, they're like, you know, I can buy religion if I don't have to swallow the idea that there is actually a thinking God who is paying attention, who deals with us as individuals. I can deal with broader strokes but, but to imagine that if I sit down and pray, something and someone with power and consequence is watching me and listening to me. That, that for many people seems like a bridge too far. Those who like religion don't seem to have a problem with it, but this is something that bothers a lot of people. But, but part of what you run into with these stories is, do these stories work without a living God? Can God simply be an idea? If you thumb your nose at an idea and get away with it, does it matter? If your hope is in a mere idea, do you have ground for optimism? If religion is merely a therapeutic device, if I gather around all the preachers and prophets who tell me exactly what I want to hear, if you go to a doctor and are filled with cancer and the doctor says, huh, oh, they're filled with cancer, but they sure don't want to hear that, so I say, hey, go back home. Eat more McDonald's, smoke more, everything will be great. You might really like going to that doctor, but is that the doctor you really want? See, something of what Jordan Peterson has noticed as he's gone through the Bible, he says, you know, in the Bible, God is a demanding father. And whereas culturally demanding fathers have gotten a bad rap, um, Demanding fathers actually generally produce pretty good children because they're demanding. And in fact, children need that kind of challenge. So we all like justice until someone points out something that we've done to violate it. Naboth was killed for justice. Naboth cursed the king. Kill him! He didn't really curse the king. He was set up. Where do we go if we discover that we are the problem? Do 
we know how uncommon self-criticism really is? Now, if you get into the gospel story, it's very interesting because the father demands justice. And the brother, who is the son, takes the punishment for his younger siblings, which are us. And, and this is beyond Ahab's show. You know, when Ahab puts on sackcloth and ashes, we just kind of think, yeah, he always does this. And sometimes when we look at our own lives and our confession, and we see how many times we have to go and confess the same sin again and again, someone could look cynically at us. But at some point, true confession looks like change and repentance and turning. And, and then we begin to imagine that the power of God through the brother creates enduring change. The power of God coming into our hearts to be like his son, our brother, and to do as he does. So I, I, I don't think this time of deconstruction is entirely unhopeful. Because I think when we look at these stories, the stories of Ahab, and we compare them to David, and Ahab and Jehoshaphat, we should ask questions and say, is this what redemption looks like? And we should look at the stories of our lives and we should look at them, try to stretch them out beyond the time frame of the moment, just like the, the, the DDT salesman to the, to the, African, um, the African chief. Is this what redemption looks like? Is this what forgiveness looks like? What does it take to do justice, even where there seems to be no payoff, including reputation, or pride. Probably the bad chieftain would look at the white guy selling the DDT and said, I want to be his friend, so I'm going to agree with everything he says. Whereas the good chieftain would have said, I don't trust that for my people. And even if it might be in my economic interest to side with the colonialist, I will stick with my people. Is it pure religion when it costs? And when it seems to not benefit you, when you hang on to God and say, even though things don't seem to be coming out as I want, I won't abandon him, and I'll hold to him still. Isn't that when we usually start asking questions? Is this real? Is this true? Can I rely on it? Let's pray. Lord, we live in a world of many options. And sometimes we don't know. Is it true? Is it real? Is it art? Am I deluding myself? Are you listening? Can you hear me? Will you save? Lord, help us to understand why the Father demands justice and enforces it. Help us to understand why the Son needs to come and how that expresses the generosity and the mercy that we need because we don't do justice. We fail at justice all the time. Help us, Lord, to look at ourselves. And when the question is asked, what is the problem with the world? To be able to stand up and say, I am. I am the problem with the world. So often my problems start not simply with other people around me, but my problems start with me. And to turn to the Son, who is our brother, and to embrace the redemption he offers, our welfare at his expense, and to receive him, and then to become like him. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?